Lecture 18. From Spinning Buckets to Special Relativity. Einstein's theory of relativity is one of the most important, influential, and intimidating theories in all of science. At first, it was not well accepted because it entailed some very counterintuitive things. That light is affected by gravity. In fact, that gravity isn't really real. Its effect on light and everything else is just a result of the curvature of space-time. It suggests that properties that seem to be objective, like the length of an object, are actually relative to a reference frame. Think about that. There is no objective fact about how long a yardstick is. This is why, even after Einstein's theory was confirmed by an observation of a star during an eclipse, we'll talk more about that cool little bit of science history later, but this is why, even after Einstein's theory was confirmed, so many scientists still refused to accept it. Of course, that didn't last. It is practically universally accepted today. Now remember, science is an offshoot of philosophy. It was first called natural philosophy. So any concrete answers that science gives us, philosophy is owed some credit. But many of the answers science does give us just end up raising more questions. And this is why the study of relativity is included in a metaphysics class. We are going to need to do some metaphysics to answer questions that relativity raises. But to even understand those questions, we are going to have to understand the theory of relativity. Which is not easy, but it's also not impossible. I'll lay it out in a way that can be understood by non-scientists. One of the driving forces behind Einstein's development of relativity was questions about the nature of space itself. Now, what do I mean by space? Consider the most distant object from you that is right now visible to you. And think about the space between you and that object. In a way, that's all I mean by space. Except, that's probably not the best example, because the space between you and that object is likely filled with air, which is made up of tiny particles. Unless, of course, that object was the sun. Now, there's a better example. Think about the space between the Earth and the sun. A couple of planets, a few asteroids, and comets aside, that space is empty. There is nothing in it. But what does the word space mean in that sentence? Is space itself a kind of substance in which objects sit? Or is space more of an idea that we can use to keep track of the relationships between objects? What would be the difference between the substance view and the relational view of space? Consider a universe that contains only two objects. Let's say two persons facing each other, just floating out there in space. For the sake of argument, we'll say they don't need to breathe air, so there is no air. It's completely empty except for these two persons. Question. Is it possible for those persons to both move exactly one foot to the left at the same time? Now keep in mind, if this happens, there will be no noticeable difference for either person. Each would be facing the same direction and be the same distance from the other person before and after the supposed move. The spatial relationship between the two persons would not change, and that's all that exists in this universe. On the substance view, such a movement is possible. On the substance view, the space in which the persons are floating is a real thing, a substance with its own properties and facts, and those persons could move within it. These are matters of fact that can serve as truth makers for propositions like, both persons moved one foot to the left. But on the relational view, this is not possible. If space is not a real thing, and all that exists is the relationship between objects, then in relation to what could both persons move to the left? Since both of them are quote-unquote moving the same direction and distance, the relationship between the two persons does not change at all. So on the relational view, there is no change. So there can't be a truth maker for both persons moved one foot to the left. The only way a change could occur is if a relationship changed, like if the distance between them increased. That is the difference between the substance or substantival view and the relational view of space. Back in the day, scientists used to call the space substance the ether, a substance in which objects sat and through which light from distant stars travels. There is a similar debate about the nature of time. Is time a substance or dimension in which objects travel, or is time merely a conceptualized way of keeping track of change? Does time really pass, or are changes just constantly occurring? 
Again, we have a substantival and a relational view. To differentiate these views, ask yourself, is it possible for all change and movement in the universe to stop at once, stay stopped for, say, a hundred years, and then start up again? Notice that if this were to occur, we would not be able to tell. Not only would we not age, and not only would our hair not grow, but since all movement and changes in our brains would cease, we would have no awareness and form no memories. For all we know, such a thing just happened. Just then. One of my favorite thought experiments, proposed by an American philosopher named Sidney Shoemaker, can expose your intuitions on this issue. Imagine a universe that consists of three regions. We'll say planets. Planet A, planet B, and planet C. Each planet is observable by the others, but travel between them is impossible. After three years, planet A freezes. All change within it stops for exactly one year. The inhabitants of planet B and C can see planet A completely frozen for an entire year. When planet A starts up again, it seems to the inhabitants of planet A that no time has passed at all, at least initially, until they look at the other planets and see that a year's worth of changes have happened there. And then the same thing happens on planet B every four years and planet C every five years. And they watch each other freeze and unfreeze. It's quite fun until the 60th year. In the 60th year, given the pattern of freezing, they will all be scheduled for a year-long freeze together at the same time. How should the inhabitants of this universe describe what happens in the 60th year? Remember, these three planets are all this universe contains, so all change in the universe is scheduled to stop in the 60th year. So is that what happens? Does everything freeze for the duration of one year, only to start up again? Or does every planet skip a freeze every 60th year? If time is merely a measure of change, since there would be no change in that 60th year, one would have to say that no time elapsed, and thus that each planet just skipped its freeze. But if you think they could all stay frozen, one must think that time is somehow substantial. It is more than just a measurement of change, but it is something in which all three planets will continue to persist through while not changing. What you think the right answer is will expose your intuitions about the nature of time. Recall our previous discussions about the nature of the timeline and whether or not future and past moments exist. Notice that a temporal ontology that includes a past, present, and future would seem to be more in line with the view that time is a substance. We could make perfect sense of what it would mean for no change to occur for a year. The timeline would simply contain a year's worth of identical moments. Whereas, if you thought that the past and future don't exist, that all that ever exists is the present moment, it would seem to make more sense to suggest that if all change stops, then time stops. For a long time, there was thought to be good evidence and reasoning behind the substantival view of space. For example, it was long thought that the nature of light was wave-like, like sound waves. Sound reaches you by sending waves through the air. Clapping my hands moves particles in the air that move other particles and eventually move your eardrum. If there were no air, there could be no sound waves. Contrary to how it's usually depicted in movies, sound cannot travel through space. A starship exploding in space would make no noise. But light can travel through space, even though there is no air. And so it was thought that space must be some kind of substance, an ether through which light waves travel. We'll talk more about the nature of light when we talk about quantum mechanics. Another piece of evidence for the substantival view is Newton's spinning bucket. Imagine a bucket filled with water and secured upright in the middle of a merry-go-round. As the bucket spins, the water will slowly climb up the sides of the bucket so that the surface of the water in the bucket becomes concave. Now, if the relational model is correct, this change in the water's surface must be due somehow to a new relation it has to something else in the world. It must be spinning in relation to something that causes its surface to be concave. But what could that be? It can't be the merry-go-round. That's spinning along with the bucket, and so the bucket's relation to it is the same, as if it were not spinning. Besides, take the merry-go-round away and just spin the bucket, and you'll get the same effect. It also can't be because the bucket is spinning in relation to the rest of the objects on the playground. 
If you were to take all of that, ground included, and put it on a giant merry-go-round with the bucket at the center, you'd get the same effect. Newton argued that the only answer that makes sense is the substantival model. The bucket is spinning in relation to space itself. Space is a substance, and the bucket is spinning within it. On the relational model, if there was a universe that contained only a bucket full of water, if the bucket started spinning, nothing would happen. The surface of the water wouldn't become concave, and there would be no way to tell if the bucket was spinning because there would be nothing else in the universe to which its relationship changed. But Newton thinks that something would happen. The water in a bucket spinning in an otherwise empty universe would become concave. And this is explained nicely on the substantival view, because the bucket would be spinning with respect to space itself. Einstein didn't like this. In fact, proving the substantival view wrong was one of his main motivations for hypothesizing the theory of relativity. Today, we'll talk about special relativity. The word relativity in the title of Einstein's theory is somewhat ironic because it begins with the assumption that certain very important things are not relative. They are constant. Specifically, the laws of physics are constant. Einstein suggested that they are all constant in all inertial reference frames. Now, what is a reference frame? Consider two spaceships that are one mile apart and will collide in one half an hour. One way to describe the situation is that both spaceships, call them A and B, are moving toward each other at one mile an hour. Another way to describe it is that spaceship A is motionless and spaceship B is moving at two miles an hour. Yet another way to describe it is that spaceship B is motionless and spaceship A is moving at two miles an hour. There are reference frames in which each one of these descriptions is true. From the reference frame of a person exactly between the two ships, where they will crash, the ships are approaching each other. From the reference frame of someone in ship A, ship A is motionless and ship B is approaching it, and vice versa for someone in ship B. Basically, there is a reference frame for any way that you could be moving or standing still in space. And it's important to realize that, in relativity theory, the existence of a reference frame is not observer-dependent. No one need actually be moving or standing still in a reference frame for it to exist. It's more of a conceptual apparatus, a way that physicists describe how an observer could be moving. It's not necessarily a way that an observer actually is moving. Now, notice that I didn't mention acceleration. A reference frame that is accelerating, that's speeding up, or it's turning a corner, or it's slowing down, is a non-inertial reference frame. And we'll talk about those later. But this is what is special about special relativity. It only applies to inertial reference frames. That is, it only applies to reference frames that are not accelerating. Einstein suggests that the laws of physics are constant in all inertial reference frames. You cannot distinguish among inertial reference frames by differentiating their physical laws from one another, because the laws remain constant from one frame of reference to the next. No matter what frame you are in, the laws of physics will be the same. And this includes, most importantly, the speed of light. The speed of light is the same in all inertial reference frames, according to Einstein. If true, this goes against the substantival view. If space were a real substance in which light traveled, then its speed would be determined in relation to that substance. The speed at which light traveled through that substance would be x, and you could figure out how fast you were traveling in space by determining how much slower than x light was traveling in relation to you. If a car going 60 is passing you at what seems to be 5 miles an hour, then you are going 55. But, according to Einstein and relativity, no matter how fast you are traveling, the speed of light will always be the same. If you measure the speed of light, no matter how fast you are going or where the light is coming from, you always get the same value, which is exactly 299,792,458 meters per second. One reason Einstein thought the speed of light was constant was because the theory that the speed of light is relative was tested and it failed the test. Scientists had measured the speed of light both with and against the direction of the Earth's orbit, but the speed of light was the same in both directions. If space is not a substance, there is no reference frame that gives you a true objective determination of everything that is happening. That's not to say that there is no objective truth. 
For example, if an object exists, it exists in all reference frames. Or if an event happens, it happens in all reference frames. But some properties that object has, or when the event takes place, will be relative to reference frames. There will be no objective fact about such things. There would be a privileged reference frame if space was substantible. The reference frame of motionless space itself would represent the objective truth. But without that, there is no fact of the matter about which reference frame gets it right. For example, think again about our colliding spaceships. Are the two ships moving toward each other, or is one sitting still with the other one moving toward it? Answer, these descriptions are equally accurate. Their truth or falsity is relative to reference frame. The existence of the ships and that they will collide is a matter of objective fact. But who is approaching whom and at what speed is relative to reference frame. The consistency of the speed of light in all reference frames has very interesting consequences. For example, not only are speed and motion relative to reference frames, but so is simultaneity, whether two events happen at once. To see why, consider a train that is moving very quickly down its tracks. Let's make it one of those cool Japanese monorails that floats using magnets, and let's imagine that it's open from the back end to the front end. Someone is standing in the middle of the train, and there are lights on either end of the train. It's nighttime and there are no other lights around. The guy on the train has a photoreceptive sensor that can detect when the light waves from each light hit his sensor. The sensor goes off and registers that light from both sources reached his sensor at the same time. Since he knows that the speed of light is constant in his reference frame, he knows the light from one source can't travel faster than the other. And since everything in the train, including the lights, are moving along with him in that frame of reference, and each light is an equal distance from him, he must conclude that the lights came on at the same time. But now suppose that you are standing outside of the train, at a train station, watching the train go by, and you have a device that shows you the results of his measurement. In your reference frame, the train, the lights, the person, and the measuring device are all moving from right to left. Now, you realize that once the light in the back of the train turns on, since the train is moving with the measuring device in it, that measuring device will actually be moving away from the light's point of origin. While at the same time, that measuring device will be moving towards the point of origin of the light at the front of the train. So, since in your reference frame, the light on the back of the train will have to play catch up, whereas the light on the front of the train will have less of a distance to traverse to reach the measuring device, the only way that they could reach the measuring device at the same time is if the light in the back of the train turned on first. So, there is no objective fact about whether or not the lights turned on at the same time. In the reference frame of the person in the train, they did. In the reference frame of the person standing outside the train, they didn't. And neither reference frame is objectively right or wrong. And this would apply to any two events in any reference frame. Because the speed of light is constant, whether or not two events are simultaneous is relative to reference frame. Think again about two people standing in different time zones. One says it's 9 o'clock, the other one says it's 10 o'clock. Both can be right because there is no objective truth in general about what time it is. It's relative to time zone. The fact that there is no such truth is often appreciated when you realize that the question, what time is it on the sun, is meaningless. In the same way, there is no objective truth about simultaneity. It's relative to reference frame. This is where the theory of relativity gets its name. And simultaneity is not the only thing that is relative. Length is also relative. If someone is traveling past you and holding a yardstick while you hold a yardstick, they will measure your yardstick as being shorter than theirs, while you will measure their yardstick as shorter than yours. And this is not a paradox, any more than it is to observe that, say, a pencil that is on your right is also to the left of the person sitting across the table from you. In fact, that's another good example. The properties of simultaneity and length are like the property of being to the right of. It all depends on your frame of reference. We can use what we already know about simultaneity to derive that length is relative. Consider again our train, but this time have it passing through a tunnel. Let's say that in the reference frame of the tunnel, from someone standing on the outside watching the train go through the tunnel, the train is the same length as the tunnel. 
The event of the front end of the engine of the train exiting the tunnel happens simultaneously with the event of the tail end of the caboose of the train entering the tunnel. For the sake of the example, let's say there is a light at each end of the tunnel. A green light that turns on when the front end of the engine exits the tunnel, and then a red light at the other end that turns on when the end of the caboose enters the tunnel. In the reference frame of the tunnel, the lights turn on at the same time. The light from them meets exactly in the middle of the tunnel, and so in that frame of reference, the train's length matches the tunnel's length. But since we know that events that are simultaneous in one reference frame will not be in another, we know that in the reference frame of the train itself, those two events will happen at different times. In the reference frame of the train, one light will turn on before the other. And the only way that could happen at different times is if the train was either longer or shorter than the tunnel. So why is the train longer than the tunnel in the train's frame of reference? Think of it this way. From the reference frame of the train, it is the tunnel that is moving. The train is standing still. In that reference frame, the light beams from the green and red lights at the opposite ends of the tunnel still meet in the middle of the tunnel, but in order for that to happen, the green light at the end of the tunnel would have to turn on first. Why? Because once the engine is halfway through the tunnel, the middle of the tunnel will be moving away from the engine of the train. And so it will be moving away from the point in space at which the engine exits the tunnel once it does. Meanwhile, however, the middle of the tunnel will be moving towards the caboose of the train and thus towards the point in space where the caboose enters the tunnel. And so the light given off when the engine exits the tunnel has further to travel to get to the middle of the tunnel. So, since it's an objective fact that the two lights met in the middle of the tunnel, the green light would have to turn on first. Thus, the front end must have exited the tunnel before the back end entered. And the only way that can happen is if the train is longer than the tunnel. And so it is, in the train's reference frame. We can also use the consistency of the speed of light to demonstrate what is called time dilation that the amount of time between events, the speed at which change is occurring, and literally the passage of time itself are relative to reference frame. The easiest way to explain why is to envision a clock that uses light to determine its movements. Let's say we have a clock that emits a beam of light towards a mirror that is placed 1.5 times 10 to the eighth meters above the clock. The distance light travels in half a second. That light then bounces back down, and when it reaches its origin source, that causes the clock to register that one second has passed, and it would then emit another beam of light. This would be a very good way to keep track of how much time has passed in your reference frame, since the speed of light is constant in your reference frame. But suppose we put an additional identical clock on a clear spaceship and watched it zoom past. We would notice that when the clock initially emitted its beam of light, the clock that emitted the light was at a certain point, let's say far to our left. The spaceship is moving so fast that when that light reaches the mirror, the clock is right in front of us. And by the time the light travels back down to the clock, it is now on our right. How far did that light travel? A lot further than 1.5 times 10 to the eighth meters, the distance that light travels in half a second. That second clock and mirror are 1.5 times 10 to the eighth meters apart, but from our point of view, the light in the clock on that spaceship didn't just bounce straight up and down between them. It followed an inverted V pattern, traveling up from the lower left to the upper middle, then down to the lower right of our field of vision. In our frame of reference, that light had to travel about four times the distance that the light in our first clock did to once again arrive at its origin. So while our first clock ticked away four seconds, the clock in the spaceship only ticked once. Thus it seems that change is happening more slowly. Time is moving more slowly in the fast-traveling spaceship. Now this is what Einstein's theory of relativity suggested was true, but is there any way to verify this? In fact, there is. Time dilation has been observed. For example, the half-life of muons, extremely fast-moving particles, is measurably longer if they are moving past us, whereas if they are sitting in a laboratory, their half-life is notably shorter. So relativity suggests some very interesting metaphysical conclusions. It teaches us about the very nature of reality. 
unlike we previously suspected, facts about simultaneity, length, and the passage of time are not objective features of the universe, but instead are relative to reference frame. In addition, the phenomena of time dilation shows us that space and time are related, and we are again wondering about whether space and time are subsentival or merely relational. Does the relativity of simultaneity, length contraction, and time dilation indicate that space and time are merely relationships between events? That all there is is different facts about how events are related in different reference frames? Or are space and time themselves, as substances, somehow being stretched or compressed in different reference frames? And, given their direct relation, are space and time actually just one substance? Indeed, even though Einstein was highly motivated against the substantival view, as he formulated his theory, he often spoke of space-time, one word, as if it were something in which objects were situated and events happened. And as we will see next lecture, Einstein even spoke as if space-time curved around massive objects. This gives us the impression that, despite his initial inclinations against it, Einstein became a substantivalist. Not one about space and not one about time, but one about space-time. Again, we will return to this topic in the next lecture. But before we do, it's worth spending a moment to understand one more element of Einstein's special theory of relativity. And that is that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. This rule holds for both objects and information and follows from one simple fact. Causes must precede their effects. The cause of an event cannot happen after the event it causes. Let's suppose you get mad at your TV and decide to pull out a gun and shoot it. I don't know why, uh, maybe the news is on. Your pulling of the trigger causes the glass of the TV to shatter. So, obviously, your pulling of the trigger must happen before the breaking of the glass. As long as the bullet does not travel faster than the speed of light, this is true. Different reference frames will measure the amount of time between the two events, between your pulling of the trigger and the glass breaking. They'll measure that as different, but none will say that the breaking of the glass occurred before your pulling of the trigger. But if the bullet did travel faster than the speed of light, it would be true in some reference frames that the glass of the TV broke before you pulled the trigger. And that cannot be true. Causality is not something that is relative to reference frame. It's an objective fact that the pulling of the trigger caused the glass to break, not vice versa. Why would this be true in some reference frames if the bullet travels faster than the speed of light? Physicists use something called the Minkowski diagram to visualize how objects move through and are related in space-time. Put simply, if the bullet travels faster than the speed of light, there will be a reference frame on the diagram that has a line of simultaneity where the TV shattering actually happens before the trigger is pulled, which again is impossible. Let's review. We've seen that Einstein's theory of relativity was motivated by a metaphysical worry, a question about the nature of reality. Einstein didn't like the substantival view of space. We now understand the basics of relativity and why it seems to prevent us from being committed to a substantival view of space. However, we have not yet dug into general relativity. And once we do, it will become clear that Einstein may have made things worse for himself. General relativity may commit us not only to a substantival view of space, but of time as well. What physicists call space-time may be a substance.